Hey, everybody. Tim Stafford, Mike Erie. Welcome to the Voxology Podcast. Delighted, as always, to be with you. And um, thank you for the, the very helpful feedback on the Barbie episode. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was great. And, you know, our, my hesitation about just three dudes talking about Barbie um, <laughs> evaporated in the light of your warm feedback. So That's right. That was awesome. Um, and since then, my daughter's seen it again. So she's seen it three times. Wow. And then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was funny. We got into a great discussion. She's like, you know, it's neither matriarchy nor patriarchy. It's partnership. Oh. Oh, come on. See, and that's what we were talking about on the episode, too, is like with my kids who are younger than your kids, it has prompted um, curiosity and conversation. And yeah. it's like that's kind of the best thing that art can do is prompt people to explore on their own inspire people to explore on their own so in that yep. light that's you know that's a pretty good success on their part oh way beyond what what meager expectations i had for such a such a film yes I'm trying, well, to, Greta trying to greta gerwig the director she's from sacramento she um she was just on smartless and she just seems delightful and just humble and excited about yeah. creating and What's she a philosophy major? Didn't she I? was, I yeah. Thought I, I thought I read that some more like... Philosophy and something else. Political science, maybe? Yeah. I don't remember, but super smart. Um, that's great. Yeah. We don't often recommend podcasts, uh, other podcasts on here. We like to pretend we're the only show in town. But um, Smartless... I think, I think they all know about Smartless. Man, yeah. last night we sat down and watched a few episodes. They, you know, they filmed a road tour yes oh my yes. gosh and i we were just my Hilarious. wife and i were i don't think we stopped laughing for a couple hours like it was just so they're, it felt they're, so good. they're they're all the way them yeah it's in every such a aspect gift. yep such a gift um and speaking of a gift i got to be on the holy post that's with right a little, uh, news segment last week it was good and so shout out to those guys and ladies it was, was a good awesome. good convo that conversation about the chat gbt for um what was it like a like an ask jeeves almost or something right yeah or, yeah yeah. ask paul ask paul <laughs> yeah that's terrible that was that was nuts and and you know sky brilliant as always but caitlin let's just talk about caitlin she's a rock star oh my goodness seriously i just can't i cannot help but think wow I think the future of Christian scholarship, if we've got a bunch of those floating around out there, yeah, pretty awesome. Now, you guys brought up a uh, point that she was wrestling through something now that most of us hit in our 40s, kind of wrestling with dogma and different things through the church. Or mm. And I was like, that's so true. Like, I see a lot of that in the younger generation, that they are crossing mm. bridges a lot earlier and asking questions a lot earlier, harder questions earlier than most of us did. Totally. So that does give me a lot of hope. Yep. That's really good. So anyway, we're full of good tidings. That's right. Just recommend a podcast of, left and right. <laughs> full of cheer. Um, anyway, Tim, how are you? Just, I mean, I know how you are. And so just as a prayer for mercy. Um, <laughs> no, do you, do you want to share just how are you? How was your week this week? I mean, it's it, we record on Friday. Yeah, my week was fine. It was just busy. We're in remodel yeah. mode, but um, yeah, and then school starting, and so we're. It's just a very chaotic time period. But went out for pizza with good friends last night, and then, like nice. I said, my wife and I watched the Smartless thing for a while and just laughed and Love went that. to bed lighthearted, which is always nice. nice. Yeah, yeah. How many how many nights a week would you describe yourself as lighthearted? As Not most. Bed. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Well, I'm trying to get better at it. I don't know yeah. I've been I've been uh, taking some good sleep aids, mm. and uh, I keep falling asleep. I normally like won't fall asleep. First of all, and then second of all, if, when if my wife comes in after me or anything like that, I'm yeah. I wake up Tim right away, but not lately. Well in Forty something years. That's right. But man, she came in there at night, and I had like remixes of the song lemon by U2 playing my phone just laying on my chest and i was out wow. <laughs> she came in the lights were on dance music was on 
and I was not awake. And she just That's paused awesome. it and turned off the lights, went to sleep. And I woke up later like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, Tim and I also got to spend some time with our mutual friend at Lake right. Tahoe. And um, there was cavorting. There, was, there were deep discussions. It was great. All right. Enough about us, Tim. Yes, finally. Enough. Um, we are picking up uh, Revelation where we last left off. We were looking at the seven churches, noticing that they exist on a spectrum of in great tension with the world around them, or not at all in tension with the world around them. And the two issues that, that were very much um, present, um, in particularly the churches that were assimilating, some sort of a false teaching around accommodating both uh, sexual morality and eating food sacrificed to idols. And, and this was such a big deal to the early church, right? That was the only thing they decreed in Acts 15, right? The, the church was threatened. Was, we were, uh, you know, the church was, um, was under threat by people saying you had to be circumcised in order to follow the Jewish Messiah. And they said, no, 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 we don't, we're not going to put stumbling blocks in front of the Gentiles. But out of respect for their brothers and sisters we're gonna, who were Jews, we're going to ask them to. And it was like abstain from eating meat with blood in it, abstain from eating meat sacrificed to idols, and then sexual morality and idolatry. And which were big, I mean, of course. But this the was like, these hits. were things on the radar. Those are the greatest hits. These were the things on the radar of Paul and the um, epistle writers and Jesus in Revelation. And so we've been trying to filter that through. Okay, so what, what, what factors and forces are around us? Primarily, most of us, uh, most of our listenership is in uh, America. And um, it's the context, the only context with which I'm and we are familiar. So uh, what are the, the, the issues that perhaps, you know, Jesus would look at our churches and point out? And one of them um, is power. And we talked about the, the wedding of political power. No matter what direction that political power is exercised, the wedding of Jesus following in political power um, is antichrist. I mean, there's just no way to pull that sucker off. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about money, which, man, that is that is the capitulation um, to culture, not only out there, but, you know, for Tim and I as people who've been in churches and served in churches. And then uh, the last one is sex, uh, money, sex, and power, the great idols of that age and this age. And they don't come to us in the forms of, you know, meat sacrificed to idols, <laughs> but they come much more you know, subversively and much more um, quietly. And so uh, I wanted to start uh, by reading an email that really articulates well the goal of the conversation we want to have around sexuality. So this, uh, this person gave me permission to share this. It's long, but so worth it. <clears throat> I'm relatively new to your podcast, having only begun listening regularly around the start of this year. I've been a Holy Post regular since mid-2015 or so, and through them I've been exposed to the wonderful world of voxological thought. I like voxological. <laughs> That's a great word. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, explorations, and experience on so many topics of daily relevance to the modern American Christ follower. Most specifically, I wanted to thank you for your discussion of queer Christianity. This topic is important to me. And a week or so ago, I searched Spotify for voxology LGBT or something along those lines, to see what you guys had already covered regarding this topic. And um, I just actually a couple minutes ago visited your website to write this, and I saw you already had a playlist. Look out. Look out. I'll be going through that in the coming weeks. Um, I greatly appreciate your even-handed stance. I myself am affirming slash side A slash heretical slash progressive, <laughs> etc. depending on who you ask. In my stance on same-sex relationships and how they play into our pursuit of God's kingdom on earth. Even though I don't necessarily agree with every interpretation I've heard on your podcast, I can't communicate how much I appreciate and value the culture of open-minded welcome you have cultivated. I can tell that regardless of your personal beliefs on the subject, and this man, this... Um, he, 
This is the goal. <laughs> you and your guests genuinely long for shalom and well-being for all, affirming and unaffirming alike. This issue is especially important to me right now because of what's happening in my own church. Uh, I'm a recent member of the Christian Reformed Church, and, and the past two weeks have been uh, difficult as our church has reignited a conversation around queer people's place in our denomination. Last year at our annual synod meeting, the majority voted in favor of giving confessional status to an interpretation of the word unchastity that includes same-sex relationships. In essence, they voted to that to be CRC, you must come into alignment with the stance of condemning same-sex behavior, regardless of whether or not it's in a loving monogamous relationship. It's brought great division into our denomination, and this year many, many proposals were brought to reconsider, delay, or lessen this decision. All were denied, and now many of our congregations, mine included, must develop a plan for the future. Will we split? Will we stay? On whom is this burden going to fall? Whom will it most impact? We're so, so confused and divided right now. It breaks my heart. I just joined this denomination. I don't want to abandon it yet. I'm queer. If I marry another man, Synod voted that that, that singular fact outweighs every other orthodox belief I hold, and I'm a confessional heretic with no home in the CRC. I've already gone through the gauntlet of growing up closeted in an unaffirming community. I know I'll just likely spend the rest of my life defending my positions against proof texts. It sucks yeah. to see this becoming a dividing wedge in my church. And Tim said, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> My goal in communicating this um, is that you made me aware of the hope that you have given me for a better third way. The muddy middle, as you've called it, is where I usually find myself in our increasingly polarized world. I love the Lord, and as much as our divided world tells me that my queerness is incompatible with my faith, my God is more essential to me than any other part of who I am. When it comes to this issue, I know two things. God loves me, and I'm queer. Mm. My desire is that my church find a way to make space for all of us. We love God, and I don't want this issue to be what identifies us, not whether we are affirming or not. I don't know what the path forward is. By God's grace, he will see us through this. So um, years ago, when um, we started this podcast in 2015, um, the, the goal was to create I mean, our, the way we said it, and it's changed over the years, but the way we initially said it was the church should be the safest place to talk about anything. Mm -hmm. And the church is supposed to love and serve the world, not sit in judgment of it. And you put those two things together, and you're hoping to create a place of hospitality and welcome. And our audience is great because they call us out when we don't, when we don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on many occasions. <laughs> You guys have come across as mean or hurtful or contemptuous, and we receive those, and we want to read all of those, yeah. you know, on episodes to be corrected. I mean, it's not an easy thing. I was inspired by this person's affirmation because uh, as we've navigated and talked about sexuality many times over the course of the last eight years, the hope has been less about all coming into agreement and more about coming to um, a welcoming and hospitable posture towards one another. And, um, and so as we go into this conversation yet again, I, I, that, the, that email coming in was such a great reminder for me mm. as I was you know, prepping all of this material of what the goal is. You know, the goal isn't that we all think the same way or that you agree with me. I mean, obviously, um, we, we share our opinions and, um, you know, lots of studying goes into that and so on, but that's not a litmus test of siblingship. Right. Um, yeah, nor, nor should it be. So all that is to say, we want to talk and, and I don't know if it'll, I've got 20 pages of notes <laughs> and I'm not sure 17 pages of notes. And I'm yeah, not don't sure exaggerate. We'll, all, we'll get all to it today. I know, I know. Well, there's a lot to say, Timothy. Yeah. And just from the front, we're not going to talk about, we're not talking about Bruno? transgender issues right now. Oh. And we're not talking about um, uh, the holiness or not of LGBTQ sexual acts. We, we want to do what we've done with money, and we want to do what we've done with power. 
which is to look at the predominant narratives and ask, how have I and how have our communities been shaped by them? Hmm. Um, and so I'm less concerned about articulating doctrinal position as I am about holding up the ways culture, Christian and non, is, is talking about sexuality mm -hmm. to just be curious about, ah, is this really, is this really everything that it's claimed to be? So I want to get that out of the way. Um, we've talked about um, LGBTQ stuff and if you're interested in our views on those sorts <laughs> enough of things, there's a playlist that there is a playlist yeah yeah, yeah. so um and, and the reason uh we want to have this conversation is um uh because culture's having it obviously our kids are having it way earlier than any any of us parents thinks they're you know uh understanding or the conversations being had and there is a great deal of um, conflicting information that are that it's given to our young folks regarding sexuality. Uh, in fact, there uh, Beth Felker Jones wrote a book called Faithful, which is a very thoughtful articulation of traditional sexual ethics, celibacy within heterosexual marriage, or celibacy in not celibacy within marriage, celibacy. Oh, wow, she's very conservative. Right. Right. Well. <laughs> Yeah, there are some who would say celibacy. No, but celibacy, unless you are in heterosexual uh, marriage. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Um, and, and it's a very, it's a very, um, I love that it's a woman articulating it because she sees the holes in purity culture and the ways Christians have done that. But she opens her book with, a, with what I thought was a really interesting example she said her, her big point is that sex is real and that it matters. That's it. And, and she says a lot of people have a stake in pretending that sex doesn't matter. So, and she uses the example of food. We all know that food matters, right? I mean, diet culture and health culture and doctor culture. I mean, that's all over everywhere. Yeah. But she said, suppose a child were talked to about food in the way that we talk to children about sex. The commands that they might hear or the story that they might have been told would sound a little bit like this. It doesn't matter what you eat or don't eat. It doesn't matter. So we're saying, and notice the echoes to how some people talk about sexuality. It doesn't matter what you eat or don't eat. Eating has nothing to do with your health. Suppose a child were given these messages around food. Food is just for the body. What really matters is your psychological health. Bodies and eating have nothing to do with that. Food is a private matter. If you, if you have a taste for something, you should eat it. Lots of it. What, whatever you eat in the privacy of your home is your decision. It doesn't affect anyone else. Don't ask where your food comes from. Nobody gets hurt in the production of your food. Nobody, nothing you eat can hurt you. Nothing you eat will help you flourish. You might like broccoli, but that doesn't mean it's good for you. It just means it's your personal preference. Mm -hmm. Food should always make you happy. Pleasure is the only reason for eating. And we hear those messages regarding food, and we think, well, that's, that's not at all how we should be talking about food, right? How, what you eat does matter a great deal. Yeah. It's real, and it matters. We're all learning that in our midlife. <laughs> oh, some of us more than others, <laughs> Timothy. Um. And she goes on to say, well, imagine that's what you're told by church and culture regarding sex, right? Doesn't matter what you do or don't do. It has nothing to do with the health of your body. It has nothing to do with your uh, psychological or spiritual health. It's a private matter. If you like something, go for it. Whatever you do in the privacy of your own home is up to you. There has no effects other than that. Don't ask where... Um, pornography and other things comes from. Nothing you do with sex will hurt you. Nothing you do with sex will help you flourish. I mean, that's kind of the picture mm -hmm. that we're given on one extreme um, is that sex isn't real and it doesn't matter. Yeah. On the other extreme, of course, are the Christians who take that idea and run with it in sometimes very harmful, harmful ways. So what I want to do is um, by the end of this, I want to have three sets of categories 
that talk about the story that I was raised in in the church, the story that I hear in our world, and then a story that I think better reflects what God is doing with bodies and why bodies um, in the text. Um, but before I get to those stories, um, Gombas taught me something years ago. Whenever you're talking about a very controversial issue, to situate yourself. Um, who am I and what community am I a part of? Hmm. And to sort of name that situation. We, we talked about in the Bible series, situating ourselves before the text, right? So, you know, when I sit down to read the Bible, I am part of a global, global military superpower. That if, I, I need to name that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I am wealthy by world standards. Can you, I am, can you explain why this posturing is important? Um, because we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to practice hermeneutical humility. We're trying to let the text speak to us rather than carry in our categories and presuppositions for the text. So this is for the reader so that when you go in, you're aware of the lenses that you are bringing to Correct. the text. Well said. Yes. Yeah, that, that could distort totally. your understanding of it, right? So I'm an individualist. I'm a consumer. Mm -hmm. I am white, male, and heterosexual. So I'm in the majority culture. Yes. The Bible is written by people who are not majority culture people. Mm -hmm. They were often oppressed by global military superpowers, and they write from the perspective of a very persecuted minority. I have to work to enter in to that reality. Whereas, you know, people in the Sudan don't. Right. Or people, in, Christians in Syria don't. So I want to do the same thing when it comes to sexuality. So, um, you know, for some, this might be just an exercise and whatever. But for me, it's really important to name who I am and um, what community um, I'm a part of. So first of all, I am beloved by God in my brokenness. Um I'm a guest at Jesus's table, and I don't have the right to determine hmm. who gets to sit there. I am a gift recipient who comes humbly. Secondly, I come with logs in my eyes. So we don't have time or interest to go into all the ways I have fallen <laughs> short. <laughs> in sexual ethics is taught in the New Testament, but, but they are legion. There are many, um, and and so I, if there are specks floating around out there, I have to acknowledge the log in my own eye first. Totally. So I just acknowledge from the outset, sin, sinful, broken, flawed, things I've done to myself, things that others have done to me, things I've done to others. Right. All of that. Of what community am I a part? Well... I am part of a community that is called to offer hospitality to the outcasts and marginalized, right? To practice new creation dynamics that don't divide the world in the way that the world divides the world. Secondly, I'm part of a community that in my deep opinion has, or not deep, but sincere opinion has done real harm mm -hmm. to LGBTQ people in the name of Jesus. They, they, they have been wounded and are wounded and set up um, in the worst possible state to figure these deep things out, cut off often as they are from family and church. Yeah. I'm part of a community in the American church that regularly fails to include single divorced and gay people and holds up heterosexual marriage as kind of the spiritual ideal for Christians. I am part of a community that is focused on sexuality disproportionately relative to its emphasis in the scriptures. Mm. So you look at how much we talk about sexuality in the West versus how much we talk about money. Evangelicals. And that will tell you everything you need to know. Exactly. And I, I firmly believe that I'm also part of a community that has lost any authority to instruct others on sexual matters. Mm. Uh, and the reason is that, of course, is our own hypocrisy. Yeah. Mine and others. So what I want to do, rather than say and declare the world, this is what you must believe. What I want to do is practice using Tim yeah, yeah. as a dear friend and my own thoughts as foil for him to react to. 
Um, and just say, here's how I've come to think about it as I've thought about evangelical culture and I've thought about non-evangelical culture. And so I'm not offering this as, th this, this is my best, though very oversimplified thinking about sexuality as a white 53, nope, 52, nope, 51, 50? Wow, okay. 37 year old. <laughs> That's a, Man. Is that a negotiation? It's like Abraham negotiating for Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Will you love me if I'm 10? All right. So um, those that's a whole, that's 26 minutes of disclaimers. Yeah. <laughs> but they seem really important, yeah. you know? So um, I want to ask the question, Timothy, because this will not shock anybody who's a regular listener. What does it mean to be human? <laughs> and... And as we talk about what it means to be human, then perhaps we might be able to discern the ways that th the modern narratives around sexuality have sort of stepped or distorted outside of that vision. So, uh, and this, um, Rob Bell, man, way back in the day, way back in the day, Robert Bell Jr., Reverend Robert Bell Jr., uh, wrote a book called Sex God. And first, I thought it was a biography. Um, but then secondly, I realized he had some really creative thinking around uh, sexuality. And I don't, I, I, I'm fairly certain he would disagree with some of his thinking now as opposed to what he wrote then. But he, but he, but he, there was a central chapter in that book that changed the way I look at sexuality. Instead of looking at the do's and the don'ts, I looked at what does it mean to be human? Hmm. So that was, that's the inspiration for this next little bit here. So we're going to read a very familiar text, Genesis 1. God said, let us make mankind. Now, it's not mankind as we've talked about. It's humanity. It's Adam. Um, and Adam can be singular and plural. Mm. You know, it can, it can refer to a gendered male. It can refer to the hum, human, you know, species as a whole. It's like the word man, right? The old use of the word man. The word man could mean a man or it could mean mankind. So Adam is better translated the human or the human race. So God created the human race. Let us make the human race in our image and in our likeness. And we've got to get to those words in a second. So they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, livestock, the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, we could spend... Days, I tell you. Days. Days. We're going to, we are, I'm prepping for a, a, a series at our church on Genesis 1 this fall. So when I say there could be days, good Lord, I'm so <laughs> oversimplifying here. But to move the thing along, let's just keep going. So the, the poetic routines of Genesis 1 are interrupted um, on days three and six. And they're, they're, and they're tied together in a beautiful way that we don't have time to explore. But here we read um, about, this is the first time we've read about the idea of God creating in the image of something. Now, it'll say about the animals, God created them according to their own kind. But this is the first time we've come across this idea that whatever is being created is created as an image. Selim is the Hebrew word. Or a likeness, demut, I think is how you would pronounce it. And um, selim in Hebrew just means a statue found in a temple. It's a likeness of God. It's like you would walk into ancient temples and there would be statues of the God. Yeah. And that would be an image of the God. It was the visible representation of the invisible deity. And, that, and the visible representation was supposed to tell you something about the invisible deity. They were uh, an expression of sovereignty. So when you walked into a temple and you saw a selim or an image or a statue, you, you knew 
that that God owned this place and was to be, you know, was the preeminent sort of ruler over this physical location. And so Selim is, was a, a common word, evidently, in the ancient Near East that just, that just meant something that represented a deity, usually found in a temple in the form of a statue. Yeah. The thing that's so crazy is that rather than priests or kings who were typically named images of the gods, it was the whole human race named image of the gods. Yeah, that'll ruin and, power dynamics a little bit. Oh my lord. It, it's I mean, ancient Near Eastern scholars, at least that I read, go crazy on this point. I mean, there's nothing in ancient culture like this. And that's really true when you look at the Babylonian account or the Egyptian accounts or the Canaanite accounts. There is nothing like this. All of those accounts are written to justify the divinity of the people in power. Totally. This account is written to justify the uniqueness of every single human being in their in a, in a role over creation. I mean, it's just utterly revolutionary. Um, and not only that, but this image is displayed in a plurality. So it's it's interesting. How many species of there uh, of humans are there? There's just one, right? There's one human being. It's a species. But in the image of God, God created him, that is human. But of what does human consist? Male and female. He created plural them. Yeah. Right? So the singular human species is manifested in the plural male and female. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So the way that it's written in Genesis 1 highlights the fact that a, a crucial part of the image of God is the maleness and the femaleness, this gender difference. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, it's this sense that human beings are one and more than one all at the same time, right? I am a singular human, and yet in the image of God male and female are required to fully bear the image. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I ask what might be a very dumb question? No, no dumb. Um, do you know, so if I was Jewish and was going to the synagogue now, currently, the scripture that they hold and read that we call the Old Testament, do those things, do the, do those track evenly or did our Old Testament change at all from what the Jewish foundational scripture was? Oh, that's a great question. From my very limited awareness, uh, from what I understand, the, that there are books that are rearranged, uh, as Amy Jill Levine has, you know. <laughs> it was funny. Very... I woke up in the middle of the night last night with this question in my head in the middle of the night, and I was like, I should have asked AJ that, and then went back to sleep. Totally, <laughs> totally. So she's, let's save it for her. Yeah. But from my understanding, no, that it is substantially the same material, um, and that Jewish scholars and Christian scholars work off of the same generally agreed upon manuscripts. Like original um, texts. Text. Well, they're not originals, but, but there are manuscript traditions that then you read variants off of. Gotcha. And, um, and so, I, 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 so, yeah, obviously interpretation uh, of these is huge. Uh, differs right. yeah, in a lot of ways. But... Uh, and one of the great gifts I would highly recommend to people who study the Bible for a living is to is to read Jewish scholarship on the Old and New Testaments. Yeah. There's a lot of great Jewish scholarship that's not Messianic Judaism on right. Jesus. Yeah. And it's super interesting. Uh, Amy Jill is a great example of that. So there's this weird... You did everything? All right, Hannah's leaving. She looks, she looks like she's going to go see her boyfriend, Judah. So she's smiling. It's different. I'm it's about different to have a magic she... interruption just to keep all the daughters, and here she comes. Oh, we love the daughters. She was man. warned not to do this, but here she is. Yeah, here she is. Hi, Mazzy. Oh, she can't hear me. But there's this beautiful thing that's happening in Genesis where it's like, in some way, that those two, male and female, 
are one and become one is really important of how and is connected to how they image God. So like a central part of sexual ethics in the Old Testament is the idea that that the male and the female are required to image God and when they join together they they image God in the best way possible. And so that that sex is the, it is the joining together of the image of God in ways that you know Genesis 2 sort of hints at and portrays. So, and there's a whole lot of other things. I just want to I wanted to I just want to like draw attention to the idea that that the the Hebrew in this poem is playing off of this idea that there's one human and there's two humans and that they're both like I'm the singular human is male and female in some plurality. And obviously that's rich fodder for Christians to read back into and develop the idea of the Trinity. But grammatically, no matter how, you know, you, your views on the Trinity, how they come about, like this is just super interesting that, that the male female split and reunification are a central part of imaging God. Hmm. Now all the questions about, well, what about, um, um, had a homosexual sexual relations or transgender people, man, I get all of those. And to, to a lot of degree, I don't know. Um, this is not something I am in any way, shape or form qualified to talk about. <laughs> um, I've read loads of books, uh, particularly transgender issue. I, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I would want to do that I want to have a much more intelligent conversation than what I can get into. So for now, that's, let's just say that's the story that's being told. Right. That humanity is, they are image bearers, and that in their maleness and femaleness, they bear the image. The command, is, of course, is to fill the earth, which is to reproduce. And, uh, you know, the rabbis would have a field day with, of the 613 commands, the first one is to have sex. Um, and implied in that is to have sex and to be created and to have physical reproductive organs. That's very good as God sort of decrees over that. So in just that little bit in Genesis 1, you get the, the beginnings of an idea that, that human beings are more than just bodies. Mm -hmm. And there to complete the trifecta <laughs> is Seth Erie. <Eyrie>. Hey. <laughs> One of you, I don't remember who emailed us in, but was very kind and said, hey, we love that your children get included in all of this. <laughs> and, you know. And so not. do we. Well, yes. <laughs> Hi, Seth. Hi. Let's, can we tell everybody it was your first day of school today? Yes. So I don't know why in Tennessee they decided that August is a school month, yeah. which is ridiculous. And then Friday being the. And then Friday half the, day half is the first day of school. <laughs> So whatevs, man. Whatevs. We got whatevs. we got up early, didn't we? Yep. Did you do anything fun? I yep. saw a video of you playing human hungry hungry hippo. Yeah. 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 Nice. Did you do anything fun? Yes. Okay. Elaborate. <laughs> what is what did you do? Uh, I did lunch. You did lunch? Yep. Okay. With, what else? With my son Sartinigus. Oh, you sat next to Nicholas, your friend? Yeah. Nice. It's hard to Seth. And your best buddy, Seth. Yeah, he has his best buddy, Seth, there. Yes. And Sophia. Oh, did you see Sophia? Yeah. Last year, at the end of the year, he sang at the kind of school closing. He sang uh, from The Greatest Showman. What's the song you sang? Uh, this is me. And then he proclaimed his love for Sophia um, <laughs> in front of the whole school. So... Glad that has <laughs> still Timmons. and Anna Timmons. Yes, we will not. Yes, so there there are crushes <laughs> every direction. All right, Sevi, I'm gonna keep going. Yes. Keep going. All okay, because right. eleven, eleven on a wizard. Eleven. Th no, this is not Revelation. This is actually. See, you're so smart. You know we're covering Revelation. Yeah. 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 So good, dude. So good. Come here, genius. All right, we're back, Sevi. We're back. So, so there's a sense already that to be embodied is to be really good. 
And that of all the ways that God could, you know, decree that humans reproduce, turns out like it's fun. <laughs> when you get to Genesis 2, and again, I'm so oversimplifying here, but the Lord God formed a man. Now, again, it's an Adam, Adam, a human, formed from the dust of the ground, which is called the Adama. So Adam and Adama is a wordplay yeah. in Hebrew. The, so the, the, the man is kind of like the dirtling or the earthling, um, to use an Eddie Vedder, you know, album title. The Lord God formed a human from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, as has been commonly noted, breath, wind, and spirit are all the same word in Hebrew. So hmm. there, there's a whole truckload that we could get yeah, into really. there. But the, but the idea is uh, the man, the human, the human one, became a living being. So the man is made, or the human is better, the, the human is made of dust, and the human is made of breath, spirit. wind, spirit. Right? It's some sort of hybrid. Yeah. And there's a beautiful psalm, uh, Psalm 8, that reflects on this hybrid nature of the human. Um, it begins by saying, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's a great, that's a great song, lyric. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. <laughs> you have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you've set in place, what is humanity that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them, and notice this spatial language, you've made them a little lower than the angels mm. and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet. And then he talks about the animals. All flocks and herds, animals of the wild, birds in the sky, fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. So this is what um, the esteemed Reverend Robert Bell Jr. Uh, pointed out, is that in the biblical story, humans aren't angels and they aren't animals. They're some hybrid Angels, evidently, can manifest physically, but the, the physical part of them isn't essential to their nature. Hmm. And animals, though uh, creaturely and have you know personality and intelligence, don't have that same breath of life that reflects the image. They don't image God the same way. And so the, the human beings are kind of in, in spatial language, lower than the angels and higher than the animals. And, um, and the idea that animals are just sort of slaves to instinct um, and desire and physical craving, and that angels don't have physical craving or desire, um, which is you know debatable based on how you read Genesis 6, but <laughs> there's a sense in which Bell was pointing out something that stuck with me ever since, which is there is this hybrid nature to what it is to be humans. Mm. We're not fully spiritual, we're embodied creatures, and we're not just embodied creatures. There's something more to us than that. Yes, Sethi, we see the mustache. <laughs> Upstairs, I love you. Go. Go, Seth Theory. Uh, oh, dude, grace for God. What? I get, I get, I wipe. You get a wipe? Yeah. Oh, to wipe your chocolate milk mustache. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the nature of human beings, Mazzy and Seth. <laughs> Beautiful examples. So, God didn't create us angels, and he didn't create us animals. We're some hybrid of the physical and spiritual. And so... Come here. We're wiping off the mustache. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Give me a little time, son. All right. We're on page six of 16. <laughs> um, <laughs> is this making sense? Yeah. And it's interesting now, too, since we've talked so much about 
um, new creation and the idea of being uh, resurrected bodies, not just being these spiritual That's it. things. So there's a lot oh, in there. This is where kind you're of... going. Stafford, you see it coming. Um, so one of the sexual stories that's told in our world comes from the church, and it's the angelic story that we're just supposed to be angels and we don't right. have, you know, and it's, and it's disembodied spirituality. These bodies don't matter, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And then in another way, we're, we're told the animal story where all we are are just desires, preferences, and cravings. And anything that tells us to restrict those is bad and harmful. Yeah. Now this is way oversimplified, but it's just a way that we're trying to talk about pornea, which is this word that is used in Revelation that has an interesting translation history. It meant and referred to lots of different things, but ultimately became a catch-all for sex outside of covenant marriage. And so in trying to deal with the question, okay, so we instantly go to the, the what's and the who's and the how's and how far's. We want to like start the question a little different place to say, okay, so the scripture opens with this male and female being naked and unashamed. And they're, they're to form some sort of kinship group. A man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now that, that's a reference to the sex act, but it's bigger than that. It's a reference to the new kinship unit that they produce. Um, and so you have, on the one hand, over-spiritualizing this from Christians and under-spiritualizing this from people who are not. And so I want to just kind of rehearse the angel story, the story that says, yeah, 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 we shouldn't have these bodily impulses and they're dirty, naughty, bad. And I want to rehearse the animal story that just says we're, we're glands and yeah. hormones and that's all we are. And in both cases, both people, both uh, people say sex doesn't matter. They just say it in much different ways. Um, so, does that make sense? Yeah. I'm trying to like, it, it, it looks so good on my notes. Well, the it's tough it's, to convey. We were talking this morning Vocal. about just again how much mystery and curiosity is being provoked, and um, we're being invited into in just faith topics. And how much scripture does that yes. too. And so the way you just laid that out as we walk in, there's so much power to be had in ignorance and people being remaining ignorant or remaining or humility. Yeah. So there, the idea of being invited in like, Hey, both of these are encouraging a very simplistic approach to this that are serving in some way or the other, yes. but they are missing the breadth of the whole thing. And that's where yeah. we're again, encouraged to have, a, a broad imagination or a, a, a big curiosity walking in because it is bigger than, but you can see right. how control is used or power over is used in keeping these things really, yep. really simplistic and, um, yep. which is like an ABC checklist to hit and then walk away. From Absolutely. It. Yep. And, and I'm oversimplifying. So I'm even guilty of it too, be, just to even try to make some of the points along the way. But I think you're doing a good job of saying this is, this has been simplified in a dangerous way. And while we don't have yes. the time to like fully open it up, we're saying, Hey, we want to start from a little bit of a different starting place than yes. Yes. the norm. So what does it mean to be human? It's, it's to be some sort of spiritual, right? Spiritual being just means of the spirit, yeah. right? The breath of life. And we're embodied and we have penises and vaginas and, and all the desires and hormones that go with them. Yeah. And so it's really interesting. It, it is. So when we get to, we're going to explore the, the two stories that, you know, are the oversimplified and common ones, and then we'll explore the more nuanced one. And I don't know that we'll all do this this episode um, or be able to. <laughs> but um, the goal would be that I'm just, we're just trying to model like how we would question the stories around money, sex, and power that we're told. Yeah in their most popular forms. Now, when we get to the angel story, the angel story um, of, you know, uh, our bodies are bad, our bodies are to be escaped from, our bodies um, are, are downfall, like that's the angel story. Um, this is a story as old as the New Testament. 
It, it was um, it was really crystallized in a second century heresy called Gnosticism. And Gnostic thought existed in the first century and much earlier than that. N uh, the word gnosis with a G is um, a word for knowledge. And Gnostics believed that there was knowledge of the spiritual realm that would save you into something called the fullness or the pleroma. Um, that there were... And, and, and Gnostics were very much um, an insider sect. They, they believed that they possessed the secret knowledge. And to have the secret knowledge was to have salvation. And so they believed, in essence, there were two gods, one greater god and one sort of demigod or lesser god. One god created the, um, the immaterial world, the spiritual world. And a lesser god created the physical world. So there was this, it's known for, uh, for its big dualism. Um, that, that has a, a dualism between the physical and the non-physical. And it's hierarchical dualism because the non-physical is better than the physical. So there's no way the same God in their thinking could have created the, the spiritual and the physical because to, the, the physical is dirty and naughty. It's tarnished. It's the lowest level of God's fullness. And this is super complicated. So I, I'm, I'm trying not to get hung up on the details, but... What we need to know is that in Gnostic thought, the bodies were, those were secondary. So you could either ignore them and discipline them um, to try to escape them, or you could give in to them uh, because it didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was what happened to the spirit part of you in the spiritual realm after you died. And so death, death is a good thing in Gnostic thought because it's necessary to separate right. the non-physical part of you from the physical part. It's crazy and how then, Gnostic our modern church has become. Oh my Lord, on everything. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yes. Yeah, yeah. Let me just, let me cut Sorry. a little more <laughs> at this. Um, the Gnostics, and again, there is no such thing as the Gnostics, but there are some generally true characteristics. Um, you... You, uh, your soul would have to ascend into the immaterial realm. And it would have to pass through various planetary spheres. Um, seven seems to be a very common number of those. And each of these was ruled by something called an archon, I think is how you pronounce it, which was a demon in charge of each planetary sphere and there were gates you had to pass through the gates and the secret knowledge was the way to get past the demons and through the gates and so on um and 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 that you would enter more fully into the kingdom of light each and you would after escape each gate from, like are you ascending further more yes. into the yeah yes so so from what i understand a very not common gnostic belief is that and this is what paul's arguing against in colossians yeah. when he uses the word fullness the word fullness, the word pleroma. And pleroma for the Gnostics was like the, the light, the kingdom of light. It was the divinity. Yeah. It was the pleroma. And, and all of creation reflected the pleroma. The, the physical world reflected it least. Mm. The immaterial world reflected it in increasing like um, uh, steps as you ascended right. past each of these yeah. gates. So when Paul talks about the fullness of the fullness of, of the deity living in Jesus, like that's like even John will say things like anyone who denies that Jesus came in the flesh is not of God. I mean, they were warring against yeah, totally. very early stages of Gnostic thinking. And you can see why Gnostic thinking, and, and even when Paul writes to Corinth, Corinth had this gnostic thing down to it too because some of them were indulging with temple prostitutes thinking that's just my body yeah totally right <laughs> and they had this slogan food for the stomach and the stomach for food yep and there were other corinthians who said no no, no even in marriage you should be celibate because sexual activity embodied activity is the lowest form yeah of spirituality actually wars against spirituality and so paul has to deal with actually the angel and animal stories right there but they're both they're both residing in gnosticism which said there is a difference between the you that inhabits the shell and the shell that carries you around totally. 
the meat bag is not important and it's an obstacle. So you can either ignore it or indulge it. Um, but this kind of, of thinking, and then it was mixed in with some parts of Christianity, some parts of Judaism, some parts of Platonism and Mithrandism. Um, not Mithrandism. I think that's the Lord of the Rings version of that. <laughs> Myth, Mithraism. <laughs> Mithras? Mithraeus? Anyway, all that is to say, the material world was bad. The spiritual world was good. And so the sexual desire was an un, unredeemed feature of the dark world, hmm. right? And so, of course, our bodies don't matter, so we can either indulge them or, you know, we need to denigrate them and ignore them. And so what happened, we, we developed kind of a Gnostic hangover where we have an over-spiritualized view of sexuality that is what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And this over-spiritualized view of sexuality is given great voice by John Piper in um, one, of his, uh, one of his papers um, on the Desiring God website. Um, I think it's called, What Would You Say to a Young Man Who Is Considering Sleeping With His Girlfriend? Um, he, he says, well, a second approach to answer that question is that is to say, and then I'm quoting what he says here, you know, don't you, that Christ died for your sins, all of them, including your future fornication. When you penetrate this woman, you thrust a sword into Jesus' side. <laughs> Think about that. Do you want to do that? Wow. All your sins, if you're a Christian, are on him. Every new sin you commit is a fresh sword thrust into the side of Jesus. Yeah. Keep that in your mind. This pleasure that you're getting is murdering the Son of God. God Don't do it like terrible that. Terrible imagery. <laughs> Jeez. No wonder we're all, all just so jacked up. Seriously. Right? And I mean, I never heard anything about what to do with desire. Yeah. Other than don't. Totally. Absolutely. Don't. Yeah. It's totally the angel view. Guys, bodies are bad. Desires are bad. Penises and vaginas are bad. Until Stay away not. from them until we flip a switch yeah. and then you get a legal piece of paper. Yeah. But yeah, the I mean, and even the word flesh in Paul's writing I was was always misunderstood to just mean being body. Just being bodily That's and embodied. So frustrating because then you obviously the obvious delineation out of here is how much abuse has happened, how much oh. sexual abuse has happened that we because of an ideology that says this is just about a carnal thing yep and i can take what i want or whatever yep. you know you can just see the whatever. delineation out of this of just yeah yep so so the gnostic story led to an overly spiritualized view of sex where you know and this is the big critique of josh butler's I was, book, I was just thinking about that is um is that you know sex is like unlocks the meaning of the universe or something. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I mean, Paul uses, and the, the Bible writers do use sex to illustrate spiritual realities. No question. There's about just not that. a period at the end of that idea. Well, yeah, yeah. I think there's, I think it's more nuanced than that, yeah. but the over spiritualization of sex then leads to a bounded set approach to mm -hmm. sex. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, sex in junior high becomes all about the rules and the regulations because it, because if you have sex outside of marriage, something very spiritually damaging is happening to you. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then there's how so those, that course, conversation is approached for both boys totally. and girls, yes, yes. which we had with, um. Sheila and Rebecca Sheila. talking about like the wedding dress, the gum on the wedding dress or totally that kind of stuff, which is not totally. how we yeah, were as boys were talked to about it. No. So the Gnostic story leads to an overly spiritual view of sex, which leads to uh, an overly rigid set of, of bounded rules. So I'm referring back to when we talked about bounded sets, yeah. fuzzy sets, centered sets. We won't rehash all of that. But the idea is that for sexuality, there was focus on the boundaries. And the question we all asked as junior high boys was how far can we go? Yep. 
um, and then proceeded to walk, you know, a couple of steps beyond that. But but it was all boundary laden. There wasn't any any conversation about what it means to be human or why did God give us desire or nothing, nothing. It was simply look. Bad things happen spiritually when you do it outside of marriage, and so you've got to restrict it. And here are the rules. Yep. And um, we like and rules. that led that led naturally to purity codes. You know, and that's what they were. They're Le- Levitical purity codes yeah. that we call purity culture, right? The goal was getting to the wedding night a virgin. The way you did that was abstaining. The manner in which that was conveyed was through threats and bribes. <laughs> and and that and and that right that it's so important that if you step outside of God's blessing, there are venereal diseases, and there's insecurity and jealousy of multiple partners. And there is you're spiritually attaching yourself to other people. And and if you wait, I mean, God has this great and joyous gift, you know, he wants to give you. <laughs> Called there, confusion. Well, <laughs> it wasn't as it, it yeah. There were there were parts I, I wish were a bit nuanced in that story. <laughs> um <laughs> and it, it and it, the problems with this, of course, is that marriage was a reward and sex was a reward mm. for obedience. Um, which, man, that energizes the whole purity conversation for men and women in ways that are super unhealthy. Um, because I'm entitled to it yep. if it's a reward. And, right? it, and it can set up a really uneven platform for the two who are joining, yes. or whether if their stories don't match. That's that was the question I got most as a college pastor. Yeah, um, it understands the problem is it understands purity as an attribute that bodies possess, and that you can have or lose. Yeah, and it's a one-time thing. Um, I've talked to people who were date raped, and they said, "Well, I lost my virginity, so why not?" Yeah, and you're like, that that. That's the that's the Christian vision. It turns bodies into commodities where some are more valuable than others. Mm-hmm. And obviously this applies way more to women than to men. I had two I was I coached football for years and I had two guys I remember telling me they wanted to sleep around but marry a virgin. <laughs> and <laughs> and it just fit. It just yep, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. It's power, possession. Yeah. Oh. So so Beth Felker Jones, she kind of outlines four either spoken or unspoken rules that kind of undergird undergird our purity codes. I can expect to get married as my reward for following the rules. I need to grit my teeth and work hard to avoid sexual intercourse before my wedding night to preserve the value of the merchandise. The whole thing is probably more important for girls than for boys, and possessing my physical virginity makes me pure. Problem is, women never hear, or they always hear, that they are the problem. They never hear that men are. Mm-hmm. They they receive the the body, and this is all stuff we talked about with Sheila and Rebecca. Mm-hmm. Their their bodies are dangerous. They're responsible for f- weak men and their sin. Yeah, someone was floating around a meme, that, and this was a real thing. That was like it was an article written by a pastor, or somebody that was like, um, "Should women have butts?" <laughs> It's just what they're talking Perfect. about. All Perfect. based in that ideology yeah. of like. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yep. <laughs> uh, but I mean, do you see the Gnosticism in all of this? Yeah. Right? I, totally. Virgin and non virgin become value and identity statements. Absolutely. Oh. Women's bodies, Beth, this is Beth speaking. Women's bodies are not prizes. And they're not valuable because they maintain purity. There is no claim that or guarantee that Christians will have the best sex ever, or that following the rules will guarantee mind blowing sex. Yeah. Um, she continues: Your body is not merchandise; it's not va- a valuable item that will be used up or spent if you have sex. Having sex does not devalue a body. The bodies of married, sexually active people are every bit as pure as the bodies of virgins. Mm. So, I so one of the really surprising things 
that as I was a pastor to young adults uh, in a young church is how many people had a hard time turning the switch on from, hey, it's dirty, naughty, and bad. Yes. To, oh, it's okay now. Yeah. There's a whole and, generation of us. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just absolutely insane. So the, the, you know, the angel story is Gnostic worldview that over-spiritualizes the sex act, which means that you have to enforce boundaries and you, you proclaim this in a bounded way. And the way you do that is through purity codes. But ultimately what it teaches us is to fear sexual desire. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and in the history of the church, this has been the predominant relationship of the church to sexual desire. I mean, Origen, early church theologian, actually followed through on the, uh, the idea of being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. Right, Jerome, um, he, he created the Latin version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, like one of the most significant pieces of literature Ever, I mean, he learned Hebrew as a way of repressing all of his sexual energy, um, and and taught that that Mary, the reason there is this perpetual virginity around Mary, is that if Mary had sex after Jesus, that would somehow pollute her mm-hmm. uh, and her holiness. Um, Augustine, God bless him, you know, said that that original sin was passed through the act of sex. So you just have this, this incredible fear combined with the call to willpower and that that is what holiness, holiness is reduced to purity and purity is reduced to virginity. Yep. So I think we can agree that that has failed miserably. Yeah, and it's caused a lot of actual physical damage in people's yes. lives. Yes, and I think we're seeing that now really pop out with all of the abuse that has come out of, oh. you know, obviously the Catholic oh, yeah. Church, but also with youth pastors and people who are towing this line and just don't know yeah. how to. Yeah, just what what yep. a mess! What a mess! So let's compare that to bits and pieces of the animal story. All right, so human beings aren't angels. We're made a little lower than the angels. We have bodies, and our bodies are good. But we're not animals. We're not just bodies. So let's talk about the animal story. Now, again, this is Mike, Erie, Mike Erie's um, filtering of like vast amounts of like highbrow scholarship. And so you don't have to agree with this characterization at all. But there's a phrase that I've come to think kind of speaks to the sexual story, the way that Gnosticism sort of undergirds the evangelical story. Oh, look at Seth Erie modeling voxology right. merch. Right. Yes, son. Let's have a great, great argument. You have a great announcement? Two, two bucks on the podcast. Woo! <laughs> he just put on his hat. Nice job, buddy. I hope he's not learning some of these words that I'm using as he's in the other room. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so th- this, this phrase is used, or, or like this idea is found in like Charles Taylor and Alistair McIntyre. Um, it's called expressive individualism. And so it's a view of human identity that says, I am... Uh, utterly autonomous and can define meaning, purpose, and identity for myself. Mm -hmm. So it's individualistic in the sense that it wants no outside influence. And it's expressive in the sense that meaning is found in the fulfillment of personal desire. So you call it expressive individualism? Individualism. Yeah. And it's called a lot of different things. Um, and, and these are the stories, th- these are kind of the assumptions that undergird this. We are not our own, or excuse me, we are each our own, mm-hmm. right? I was thinking, the, I listened to I Am Mine by uh, Pearl Jam earlier today as I was working on this. And he's like, we are, we, bo- we are born and we are die, the in-between is mine. I am mine. That is beautifully expressing one of the major assumptions of human identity and what human beings are is that they are solitary autonomous individuals Um, we are self-determining and self-creating 
Freedom is the absence of limits. I choose my purpose, define my identity, and interpret my own experience. I select my values and elect where I belong. I am responsible to find meaning. I am the only one who can set limits on what I can be or do. No one else has the right to define me. Social, moral, natural, or religious values are things to be overcome and obstacles to self-fulfillment. We are autonomous, free, atomistic individuals who find our greatest fulfillment in breaking free from all external norms. No other person or institution has the authority to impose their morality on me. And there are parts of this story I totally agree with. Um, you know, when you compare it to the Gnostic story, like, okay, there's some good correctives here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's funny because, and I don't want to sound like, you know, the get off my lawn guy. Um, <laughs> but like, I can't watch a Disney movie anymore without this phrase like floating all over, you know, my subconscious because literally the, the core of the movie is you're not being true to yourself. Your family and culture wants, wants you to be something else than what's true to you. And it, then it's the story about being true to you. Yeah. And so even this phrase, true to yourself, is an interesting Western sort of enlightened phrase. Now, again, there are parts of this that are absolutely great. Um, but there, there's a sense in which um, there's something that's deeply lost in having the self be the center, you know, and, and the idea that constraints are always bad and that freedom is freedom from something, not freedom to something or freedom for something. Um, and, and scholars have characterized this in a lot of different ways. Charles Taylor talks about like the disenchantment of the world mm. and the fact that the transcendent frame of human reference regarding the divine um, has been replaced by an imminent frame of reference, which is just me and you know my, the horizons of my brain, my imagination, my desires and preferences or whatever. Um, another scholar talks about how the first cultural world that our humans inhabited was a cultural world of pagan myth. Um, and and that, that, that in that world, there was sacred order to things. Um, whether that world was, you know, uh, pagan divinities or Rome, Roman religion or whatever, like there was a sacred order. That first world, first cultural world was replaced by a second cultural world, which was the, the Christian world story, right? And again, we're just talking about the West here. But the idea is that the sacred ordering that pagan mythology provided was replaced by a sacred order, ordering under the banner of the Christian church. These days, we have a third world, cultural world, characterized by the individual self, this idea of expressive individualism, which throws out any notion of divine order and is committed, I'm quoting here, to the revolutionary demolition of the theological and moral order that formed the social imagination of the second and first worlds. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so and, and this, I mean, again, this is so easy to take shots at, right? And you, I, I even hate using some of these words because I can hear them, you know, used by Christians in very unsophisticated pop culture sort of, you know, uh, making fun of the believe in yourself, follow your heart kind of motif. But because this is this view of being human is ascendant right now, it does kind of, when you step back and think about it, it does kind of sound like everything that we hear. Um, and, you know, the hero's journey is the hero to be true to your, the, the journey to be true to yourself. Right. And when you kind of focus on that, um, uh, that frame of reference, um, it's easy to have an unspiritualized or under-spiritualized view of sex, yeah. right? Because you belong to you. Yeah. There is no, there's what, outside of consent, what other order could possibly be placed on a person regarding sexuality, right? So if Piper illustrated the, the angel view, here's a, a tweet from Planned Parenthood, 
Don't yuck someone else's yum. <laughs> Everyone deserves the freedom to explore their own sexuality free of shame and stigma. And we, and, and even in the church, we'd all look at that and say, well, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, if, the, if it's the choice between that view or the, the Gnostic purity code, I'm going to go this way. Easy. And not surprisingly, if the angel story with an over-spiritualized view of sex leads to a bounded focus, a bounded set focus, here with an under-spiritualized view of sex, it's a fuzzy set focus, right? I mean, we're united in there not being lines. Right. Um, th that, that, I mean, and there are, of course, consent being foremost among them, but, you know, even um, sex with minors, uh, sex with animals, but, you know, it's, it's interesting whether or not there, there are people marching around saying, hey, all the slippery slopes we identified before have come true. Right. So it's only a matter of time. And I have no idea. I, I don't buy the fear mongering behind all of that. No. But I do think, I do call or would want to call into question the, the, the view of sexuality that simply says, all it is is my yum. You have a different yum and you have no right to judge mine. <laughs> Um, and all yums within, you know, reason are created equal. It's just preference. And that goes back to the food example that Amy Felker Jones was right. using, right? It's just, it doesn't matter. It's just a private matter of individual preference. And if two people agree, then what is it of your business? And so, you know, you have an under spiritualized view that there's nothing else happening. So it's not surprising that an under-spiritualized view of sex, because that's really what it is. And, and it, it's what we talked about with Corinth, right? Uh, the food is for the body, the body is for food. And so, of course, if you're hungry, eat. If you're thirsty, drink. It's like, this is what bodies do. Yeah, don't yuck someone else's it, yum. That's it, baby. <laughs> and hello, Seth. Hello, Seth, me. Yeah, you are Seth, absolutely. <laughs> All right, can you give me a couple more minutes? I'm almost done. Yeah. Okay. Get, put that back in my ear. Okay. 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 Can you go do the floppy? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hit the, hit the theme song. Hit the theme song. Hit that chocolate milk theme song, too. Hit the chocolate milk theme song? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, and so there's a sense in which, uh, not surprisingly... Right, you would if you're looking at the set theory that we examined episodes and episodes ago. If um, an over, you know, spiritualized view leads to a bounded set, then this is of course a fuzzy set. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the elimination of all the boundaries and the lines with kind of the bare minimum of approach of consent, and uh, and consent can be spelled out a lot of different ways. You can even talk about consent. Like I remember there was this picture of um an, a consent code from antioch college years ago that was like here's what consent means um you have to ask if you initiate every new level you have to receive verbal you know approval groans or yeses don't count like like it was like very it was a very bounded way of like talking about consent and i'm all for consent absolutely i mean the the scripture is full of reciprocity and mutuality and so on. So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying, what else could you base it on if your view of the human person is just we are appetites right. and hormones? And um, and it's like you know, spring break. Well, of course they're going to do it. So we just got to give them, we just got to give them condoms. Like there's no, it, it, it's foreign to even think about people restraining um, sexual desire. Yeah, well, everything and, is two dimensional on both sides of that fence. Like. That's that's the point we're going yeah. at. That's the point. Yes, neither I think embodies the full humanness of the biblical story and the invitation to consider sexuality um, as part of what it is to be human in God's world. Yeah. So if sin again, just because I like to weave this back in every now and then, mm -hmm. is about missing the mark of being fully human. Um, that would make sense in this conversation of on both, on both sides of that. Yeah. Um, are yeah. ways in which we are not embodying or fulfilling or, um, 
restoring humanity and other people or dignity or offering restoration or dignity or fullness of someone else's humanness. Right. And this whole right. thing. That's exactly right. So if, if the Gnostic, you know, angel view told us to fear sexual desire, the animal view just says, follow it wherever it goes. And, um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to spend a lot of time questioning that. I mean, obviously there are sexual addictions and sexual abuse and that can lead you into trouble, but by and large, it's a bodily thing. And who are you to yuck someone else's yum? And so if terrible phrase, such a terrible phrase, I just thought it's so perfectly embodied. Um, and so John Tyson, um, who was a pastor, I think he still is in New York. So there's the third option between fear, desire, and follow desire, and that's form desire. Desire can be formed, the spiritual formation of desire. And I was never, never taught about any of this. Mm -hmm. And um, and there is a different way of uh, beyond purity codes and um, you know consent. There's the invitation to wisdom. Yeah. And there's beyond bounded sets and fuzzy sets. There's centered sets. What does a centered set approach look like? Yeah to sexuality. Um, and, uh, and so I think, and again, I mean, agree, disagree. I always feel weird putting all this stuff out there, um, because of how all of it's been abused or misused or whatever. No, I think you're doing a good but, job because you're, you're building a platform to start to ask questions from, or to, with with a direction on how to kind of en re-engage this conversation yes. rather than just saying totally. this you know what this way wasn't right this way wasn't right let me tell you the exact way where yes. you're inviting us into a conversation that i think is very important that is again three-dimensional or four-dimensional and not well hopefully that because we're not we haven't yet talked about you know how far and although i mean when i when i was you know talking to my my kids and this is a like this is so different from how I was told to parent. You know, wait, I think you should them. save this. I think you should save this and we should do, we should spend time on this. Oh, okay. Cause I think there's a lot, cause I, every time we have this Great. conversation, we get a lot of emails that are like, okay, then what? Like, okay. wh how do I, what do I do with my desire? What, and if I'm not looking at gatekeeping and I'm not looking at boundaries or I'm not looking at lines, then what? Yeah. And yes. So that's from the front side of the question and the backs of the question with all of us that grew up and are, are carrying shame into our marriages and that kind of stuff. The question then becomes, well, how do I look backward or how do I reconvene my yeah. understanding now so that I can have a healthy sexual relationship with my partner? So, oh, so that's a good. very big and it's like it's like the center set stuff actually, I think, is the perfect yeah, a uh, metaphor or way to kind of approach this conversation because it's it's not redefining the boundary or the fuzzy. It's saying no, we're it, you're that's the wrong vantage point to begin yeah. from. So let's talk about a healthy. That's right. God what is a fully vantage. human? Yes. What is a fully human embodied spirituality approach look like? To sex and not that we know and the full we, answer to that but i think having a, a nuanced conversation about it would be helpful it'd be helpful for but me. i, I all, well all the work that we just did was designed to get us to that question yeah because well, that job. for me <laughs> i always i always started with behavior and well, that's what we were told yeah and even in therapy you know as as i'm going over this stuff with my therapist he's okay. like he's not like spending any time on that mm-hmm you know, none, none of it's correcting behavior. It's all like, how do you see yourself and, and, and how, oh, what yeah. messages have you internalized? That's the third piece that I wanted to ask and, and we can pursue in this other conversation is the idea yeah. of individualism as individuals. Because often when the individual, indiv indiv individualistic nature gets um, said, no, that's not how you, we are meant to operate it gets really confusing for people who have thoughts in their heads. You know what I mean? Like who mm -hmm. are, I don't know. So having a healthy understanding of what it means to be an individual within a communal right. unit. No, that's it. You, because you're absolutely right. My body isn't my families or my churches. Right. 
-hmm. but but Paul will also say your body isn't made for pernia it's made for the lord yeah so this is a very nuanced again three-dimensional conversation about what it means to be an individual but not be individualistic so Uh, all those questions i think would be really fun to explore well said (laughs) okay so here's what we're going to do dear listeners if you've made it this far next episode we have an interview with caitlin shess regarding her new book the ballot in the bible which dude it's killer and then we'll we'll come back and we'll try to present oh, yeah. a view of sexuality that's embodied, that's center set, that's wisdom, um, and that doesn't fear or follow desire, but but seeks to see it formed yeah. around our full humanness. Oh, yeah, yeah. And 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 we don't have my goodness, I you know, my therapist and many other people close to me can tell you we're not, we haven't got this nailed. No. <laughs> but I, I the questions that this leads me to feel so much healthier yes. than the questions of previous. Yes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm. anywho, I hope this is helpful. And, you know, back to our emailer, the goal is to create a, a hospitable place where we can just be curious about the things that we're being told and immersed in yeah. and consider communal imaginative possibilities where we can provide a counter narrative even to some narratives in the church yep. you know yep so anyway all right, all right seth you yes. want to do shema buddy yes all right let's do it ready shema israel okay i think we're blowing out our microphones yes <laughs> now say it Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Bye. 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 Bye.